Okay, any fisher now has this cookie so we can get underway. <laughs> so our next speaker is uh, Bas Surard. Did I get that close? Yeah. Hey, thank That's you. Right. Practiced all day. Okay. And Bas is um, coming, uh, visiting from the uh, University of Calgary where he's doing a postdoc uh, with um, Paul Cubes, who is well known to this, uh, many, of, many of you in this audience. Um, and uh, does a variety of work. I'm not sure what he's going to talk about because he told me he's changing his topic. But in any case, um, but he does work in, in sepsis and complement and uh, mechanisms underlying sepsis. He um, trained at uh, the University of Utrecht um, and we're pleased to have him here. Well, thank you, Ed, for that nice introduction. And I would like to thank, of course, all the organizers for having me at this, uh, this wonderful meeting. I'm, I'm actually a microbiologist, and I'm kind of new to the field of hematology, and I learned a lot already. But um, today I'm going to talk about the specific toxin and how this affects platelet function during, during sepsis. So I do have something to disclose for this talk. Our lab has um, has received some financial support from MedImmune in the form of a research grant. So sepsis. So sepsis is really the clinical manifest manifestation of an overt inflammatory reaction to a pathogen in the vasculature. And what really happens is that it's an interplay between the pathogen, immune cells, and um, components of the hemostatic system, such as platelets and coagulation factors. And what you see typically occurring in patients is that you get occlusion of small blood vessels throughout the body and in, uh, in several organs. And this can lead to, um, uh, to multi-organ dysfunction. And in the worst case, it can actually lead to uh, disseminated intervascular coagulation, or DIC. But what, uh, what is not really well known is how some pathogens in influence this course of, uh, of, of sepsis. So today I'm going to talk about one particular virulence factor from staph and how this affects uh, platelet function during, uh, during sepsis. So Staphylococcus aureus is a very important pathogen. It's cu currently one of the leading causes of death by any infectious disease in the Western world. It's, in fact, it causes more annual death than HIV and influenza combined. Uh, and important for this talk is that it's also uh, commonly isolated in uh, patients with sepsis. What really complicates its treatment is that, there's, uh, that this pathogen tends to acquire a lot of antibiotic resistance and uh, that there is no vaccine available for, uh, for staph. And that's why it's called a superbug, because it's uh, highly resistant against uh, antibiotics. But I like to call it a superbug for a different reason, and that is because it has evolved numerous ways of evading the immune system. So staph can secrete over 50 molecules that all hamper different parts of the immune system, and thereby uh, um, causing it to evade uh, immune responses and survive and cause disease. Also, it can produce a whole array of toxins. Over 15 toxins are described for staph. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about one particular toxin. It's called alpha toxin or hemolysin alpha. And this one was the first toxin discovered actually for staph. It's uh, been discovered 50 years ago. And its expression really correlates with the pathogenicity of the staph strain. Um, if you have an invasive staphylococcal disease patient, then uh, usually these, these strains express high levels of this, uh, this toxin. What really sparked its research uh, lately was the discovery of the cellular receptor for alpha toxin, and that is ADAM10. ADAM10 is a, uh, a prote protease, and it's expressed on many cell types. And the expression of this uh, receptor really dictates whether a cell is susceptible to intoxication by this toxin, yes or no. And it also determines the species specificity. So what happens when you have a high concentration of toxin, um, uh, a high concentration of toxin and you have the, the receptor, then the cell, um, then the, it will form, it will oligomerize into a heptameric pore, so something like this, and this will lyse the target cell. However, at low concentrations, at subletic concentrations, it can do a different thing. So the toxin has two functions. It can form a pore and it can activate the protease. And especially on endothelial, epithelial cells, this can lead to cleavage of its natural substrates, uh, E and V-E-catherin. And that's mediated through ADAM10 activation. 
And this will lead to increased permeability of the tissue and uh, the staph uses this to disseminate throughout the body and cause disease. What is also known already for 30 years is that subplatelet concentrations of alpha toxic can facilitate uh, platelet ag uh, aggregation. And this was all done in, in the confines of the test tube. But what is occurring during, uh, during sepsis or during um, an infection is not really well known. And um, uh, that's why we performed this study. And, and another thing that was uh, very recent li literature is that if you knock out the receptor of ADAM10, uh, specifically on platelets and myeloid cells, then these cells are completely protected from staphylococcal sepsis. Whereas if you knock it out on, on platelets only or on myeloid cells only, then they, uh, they, they die as the wild type controls. So it really uh, shows that this is an interplay between, um, the, between platelet immune cells and, 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 the, and the bacteria. So my hypothesis for today is that staphylococcal sepsis will lead to HCLA-dependent uh, platelet aggregation, thrombocytopenia, and organ dysfunction. And our lab is, um, uh, uh, uses intervital microscopy of, of living mice to uh, visualize processes. And what we do is we take a mouse, uh, we, uh, we put them under anesthesia, uh, under anesthesia, so it's still alive, and then we, um, uh, we expose the organ of interest. And, uh, uh, and what we also do is we insert a bloodline. And through this bloodline, we can actually in inject fluorescent antibodies or fluorescent bacteria. And then we can visualize these processes in vivo in a living mouse and through a microscope. And this microscope is special because it has a spinning disc. And this will allow for uh, tracking fast moving cells in vivo in a living mouse. So this is what it looks like, and for instance, we are interested in the liver, because the liver is a very important immune uh, organ. Um, and what you see here is in dull green are hepatocytes, and in between there are the sinusoids in blue. So these blue linings are the, uh, the sinusoids, so the endothelial cells, which are stained with an antibody against CD31. What you can also see is in purple the Cooper cells. And these Cooper cells, they are non-migrating. They sit there basically waiting for bacteria to flow by, and then they grab them out of the circulation. Another cell type which you see which is migrating here are INKT cells, but I'm not going to talk about today. But what we can also do is you can visualize platelets in the circulation. And what we did here is we injected a fluorescent antibody against CD49B. And what you see is uh, platelets zapping through the circulation without adhering to anything. Uh, the video stopped, but um, sorry. But what you see is that it, uh, it uh, quickly, uh, these cells just zap in the circulation, they don't really adhere to anything, uh, and this is in the baseline conditions. So if we now uh, take a slightly higher magnification of the liver, again you see in green the hepatocytes, in purple the Cooper cells, and in between here are the sinusoids. And again I labeled the platelets in blue, but after one minute I started infusing one microgram of uh, alpha toxin, and this is what happens. You get this massive aggregation of platelets in the circulation, and all these platelets get deposited in the liver. And as you can see, um, later on, these mice start to shake, and that means that it's really having perfusion difficulties and problems uh, breathing. So it's really potent in aggregating platelets, also in an in vivo setting, this toxin. So if you quantify it, it's uh, really black and white. It occurs really rapidly. You see within 10 minutes, you get massive aggregation of platelets, and these get deposited in the liver, whereas a sham surgery, you don't see this. Uh, if we now look at other uh, different vascular beds, such as the lung, so here we labeled uh, the vasculature in red, and this is an alveoli here, and in blue are the platelets. And if I now inject alpha toxin in these mice, uh, this is what happens. You still see these platelets aggregating uh, here, but they're not being retained. So they're not adhering to the, um, to the vasculature, and they did just get washed away uh, quite rapidly. And, and if we quantify um, a different vascular bed and see where these pl uh, platelet aggregates are being deposited, then it's mainly in the liver. Uh, we looked at the skin, the lung, and the kidney tubal area. We do also see some of these aggregates actually adhering in the glomeruli, but that's um, a different imaging process, which I haven't shown here today. 
So what happens to these aggregates? So if we now zoom in on, uh, on, the, on a small area of the liver, and I stain for endothelium, kupfer cells, and platelets, then you see that these aggregates actually adhere to two things, either to the endothelium or to, uh, to kupfer cells. And in line with this, if we now deplete kupfer cells, uh, by injection of uh, clondonate liposomes, then you see that the Coop cells are all gone. They are here in red in the control mice, but when you inject clondonate liposomes, they're all being depleted. Um, if we then look at plated aggregation in, in these mice and the, the dip deposition in the, in the liver, you can see that there's about a 50% reduction, which is in line with what we saw earlier, that they can also um, uh, adhere to the, end uh, to the endothelium. So what happens to these uh, aggregates? Are they uh, just loosely adherent or are they really ir irreversibly aggregated? So for this we, um, we approach it differently. We also inject it at the same time as the alpha toxin. We injected an antibody ag against P-selectin, which is fluorescent in green. And what we saw is once these aggregates have been formed, then they start expressing uh, P-selectin. So this is a measure of alpha granule secretion and irreversible uh, aggregation of the platelets. So these platelets are stuck and don't go anywhere anymore. And what we can also see is that uh, at this concentration of alpha toxin, these mice start to die really quickly. And this is partly contributed to the uh, platelet aggregation, because if we deplete platelets, then they live well, a little bit longer. Alpha toxin does more. These mice eventually die of edema in the lungs, but uh, certainly at the beginning, this early stage is dependent on platelet uh, aggregation. So how about, what is the specificity? What is this toxin doing to the platelets that they uh, start to aggregate? So we looked at whether we could see a lot of endothelial damage, and that might, uh, um, uh, uh, might, might, might facilitate um, the, the, the aggregation of platelets, but we don't see that. So if we stain for propidium iodide, and this is um, a stitched image of the liver 15 minutes after uh, alpha toxin injection, you see all these aggregates be, ha have been formed, but we don't see that all the endothelial cells have light up in, uh, in red. So they're not dead. So there's not a lot of en endothelial cell damage that we can see. Furthermore, we, um, we have a mutant, mutant toxin, and this mutant toxin can still bind to platelets, but cannot form an, uh, an uh, cannot oligomerize and cannot form a pore. So when we, um, uh, when we inject this mutant toxin, they also don't, uh, uh, this to uh, mutant doesn't induce the platelet aggregation anymore. So it's, uh, it's not only the binding that facilitates this aggregation, it's also the, the activation of the atom 10 or the, uh, the pore formation. Um, and then, this is the most important experiment that we probably have done. We, uh, we used the platelet-specific atom 10 knockouts. So these PF4 atom 10 mice, they also are completely resistant against uh, alpha toxin-induced platelet aggregation. And this really shows that there's a direct effect on the platelets and not lysing all kinds of ho uh, host cells and thereby activating the platelets. So it's really a direct effect on the platelets. And we can also see that in vivo. So if we now take a specific uh, toxin, uh, alpha toxin, which we labeled with a fluorescent dye, and then we infuse this fluorescent, uh, the fluorescent labeled alpha toxin in, in the mice, which the, where the platelets were labeled in, in red, what you see here is we infuse the toxin, you see these aggregates being formed, and you see the binding of the toxin right to these aggregates. So it's really direct binding of the toxin to the platelets, and that's medi uh, mediating the aggregation. And if we zoom in, you can really appreciate that in, in the core of these aggregates, there is binding of the, of the toxin. If you do this in an of 10 PF, uh, PF4 cream mice, then you don't see this binding to the platelets and no aggregation. What happens next is we see that uh, after uh, alpha toxin uh, intoxication, these platelets uh, get activated and they use their own cellular machinery to uh, start to aggregate. Because if we do it in the CD41 or GP1 beta knockout, then you also don't see this aggregation anymore. So now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and. Um, uh, Medimmune is a pharmaceutical company. They currently have an, uh, a therapeutic monoclonal antibody, and it's in uh, phase 2b clinical trials. 
for the prevention of uh, staphylococcal um, uh, in, uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. And what they have shown in, in, in vivo, in mice models, is that this, this monoclonal antibody, MEDI 14893, it mediates protection against uh, several staphylococcal uh, diseases such as pneumonia, skin infection, and sepsis. So if we use this, um, this MEDI antibody in our assay, we also, and we prophylactic, prophylactically treat these mice with, uh, with the antibody, then we see that this toxic cannot induce platelet aggregation anymore. So we have uh, a way to target this, uh, this process. We can also show that if we, um, in the blood, that if we look at uh, alpha toxin infusing in, in uh, wild time mice, the isotypes, uh, you see that the, the platelet levels start to drop really rapidly and they get deposited in the liver as aggregates. If we now treat these mice prophylactically with the MEDI antibody, you see that these are completely protected from uh, alpha toxin induced uh, intoxication, uh, uh, induced thrombocytopenia. Uh, if we look in the liver, when we inject the toxin, you see these large areas of non perfusion. And this is uh, really um, um, uh, the cause uh, to uh, microvascular occlusion of the blood vessels. Uh, if you treat these mice with a, a MEDI antibody, then you don't see that, and they are, the livers are just well perfused. And also in mortality, these mice are completely protected from uh, alpha toxin intoxication. Now, what about infection? So this, uh, before I've only shown direct effect of the toxin, but of course an infection is uh, way different. And um, so we're wondering what happens here during the course of these infections. And what I've shown before in, um, uh, in, another, in a previous paper is that uh, for, the, for staphylococcal infections in the bloodstream, the liver is really the bottleneck of the immune response. So when you inject staph into the circulation, um, you see that 90% of the bacteria get taken up by the Kupfer cells. So here is again a liver image, in purple are the Kupfer cells, and then I inject green fluorescent bacteria. Oh, let's start. And what you see is within five minutes, all these bacteria are getting grabbed from the circulation and taken up by these Kupfer cells. If we now look at the platelet response after infection, this is what happens. You also see that there is a massive uh, a coating of these bacteria with platelets. And, and this is an or early onset platelet aggregation which happens on the bacteria and on the Kupfer cells. And this is actually an, uh, a protective response. So our lab four years ago published this paper in Nature Medicine where you see that after infection you get the, uh, 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 the uptake of bacteria by Kupfer cells and then these, these bacteria are actually covered, they're cloaked with platelets and this uh, mediates uh, host protection because if you don't have these platelets here then these mice die really quickly of infection. So there is an early platelet response after infection which is really rapid within 30 minutes and this provides uh, host protection. It's an innate response. If we now inject bacteria which lack um, the alpha toxin, so it's a mutant bacteria, it doesn't express alpha toxin and we look at this early response we see that this is independent of alpha toxin because you still see these early aggregates are happening. Um, and actually what we, uh, what we can show is that uh, this, uh, this early response even occurs with dead bacteria or only cell wall fractions. So it's really an, an innate immune response. And uh, if we do this in a, in a C3, so a complement C3 deficient mouse, then you don't see this happening. So these bacteria are not getting covered anymore and they do way worse in infection. So this is a complement mediated uh, phenomena. Um, and we can uh, show this in, uh, in three different mice. So in the wild time mice, you get an early protective response. This is still there in the PF Adam 10 Cree. So they, these are not susceptible to uh, alpha toxin, but this early response is still there. It's uh, not significantly different from the wild time mice. However, uh, there's about a 75% reduction in the C3 knockout mice. So if we now look, why, um, why is there no uh, response of alpha toxin yet? Well, simply, it's just not expressed. So if we use, a, um, I regenerated the reporter bacteria, and this bacteria will light up in green when G alpha toxin is expressed. And early on in infection, 15 minutes after infection, you don't see any green uh, being produced. 
However, after six hours of infection, you start to see these, uh, these bacteria light up in green. They're still alive, they, uh, they produce uh, this toxin, and then it's when you start to see um, uh, uh, detrimental platelet aggregates. So here you see big aggregates formed in the liver eight hours after infection. They're not co-localizing co with the bacteria anymore because the toxin is released in the circulation and this causes uh, troubles and vascular occlusion. Um, if we now look at the area of the liver covered by platelets at uh, a different time points after infection, then you see that in the beginning there's no difference between the wild type and the alpha toxin mutant. However, after eight hours you start to see these differences and there's about a 50% reduction in uh, the platelet covered area of the liver. This holds on till about 24 hours and then um, uh, the, you cannot find these aggregates anymore. We can phenocopy this, so this was with the alpha toxin mutant. We can also treat these mice with the MEDI antibody and then uh, you can prevent these, uh, these, these uh, vascular occlusions from happening. And if we now look at the liver 24 hours after infection, what you see with the wild type infection, uh, these, these livers look really bad and you get all these uh, focal necrotic lesions that are occurring through this, um, uh, this toxin mediated event of a vascular occlusion. So you see all these, these lesions occurring in the liver, whereas if, when you use an alpha toxin mutant, you don't see this happening. And there's about a 50% reduction in the amount of liver damage when you, when you use a mutant of alpha toxin. Um, if we now look at, uh, at mice which were prophylactically treated with the MEDI antibody, then you also don't see these, these, uh, these the, uh, the, they also see this drop in the uh, serum ALT, so they're also more protected against uh, liver damage. So this brings me to my conclusions. First of all, alpha toxin intoxication leads to platelet aggregation in the vasculature, and these aggregates, they, um, they get sub subsequently deposited in the liver. Um, in an infection, Staph aureus or all bacteria uh, induce a, like a biphasic uh, platelet response. So first you get this early onset protective response on platelets, which is mediated through complement uh, molecule C3. And secondary, you get a more pathological platelet aggregation, which is largely dependent for staph, at least, on uh, alpha toxin. And we can prevent that from happening with the MEDI-141893 antibody. And this provides protectors against this uh, staphylococcal-induced uh, microvascular dysfunction. So with that, I would like to thank Paul Koops for, uh, for his ongoing mentorship and all the Paul Koops lab members. We would like to thank, uh, I would like to thank all the people from Medimmune, Brad Selman, and Craig, uh, Ken, Ken Stover, and uh, of course um, uh, my funding agencies, AIHS, CIHR, and Marie Curie. So with that, I would like to, uh, to take any questions from you guys. Thank you. You said that the toxin has to oligomerize to be introduced to bind to its receptor, if I, if I understood you correctly. Uh, you said it goes in as a hexamer or heptamer? No, sorry, I wasn't clear here. But uh, the toxin itself uh, goes in as, an, uh, as a single unit, but once it finds the receptor, then it starts to oligomerize and forms a pore. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it, does, I, it doesn't need to be in an oligomeric form no, to bind to, to, to no, the receptor. No, no, no. It can bind separately and activate the, uh, the, 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 the receptor, so the atom 10. And if you have a high enough concentration, then it forms a pore, and this causes uh, uh, cell damage. I, I was thinking of the anthrax toxin, which has to form a heptamer to bind to its receptor. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I guess I missed that part. So have you looked at endothelial permeability? Um, uh, so yes, we've done that. And we only see this uh, occurring uh, or difficulties uh, uh, or m more permeability. We see that after a couple of hours after intoxication. So it's not this rapid event of platelet aggregation, but it, uh, it occurs later on in... Uh, in uh, 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 with, with just the toxin. If you look at infection studies and you give, for instance, a pneumonia model, then 
uh, the permeability increases with, when the toxin is present. But we haven't looked at this because we look at uh, uh, it from a sepsis point of view, and then we don't see really that happens that quickly. Bus, I have two What's happening in the sinusoids of this spleen? You, mentioned you looked at various other organs, lungs, kidneys, and I didn't see spleen. No, so we actually did look at the spleen, not for this toxin, but for different reasons. But there is already a vast reservoir of platelets in there. And so it's really hard to see additional aggregates being formed. Um, what we did see is these aggregates are very, very dynamic. And uh, when we add in the toxin, then uh, the dynamic stops. So, but it could also be because all the platelets are being deposited in the liver. Oh. We don't see many de uh, platelet deposits in the spleen there. Okay. Okay. Second question I have is, um, uh, clinically, you know, we see a lot of thrombocytopenia in patients with infections and sepsis in particular. So do you think that this may be the mechanism at least for the non-toxin mediated platelet aggregation you're seeing? Is that common to other organisms? Uh, yes, at least for the gram-positive ones, we do see that uh, as soon as you introduce a pathogen in the circulation, you get complement deposition and that induces the um, uh, platelets to bind. But this is fairly... Um, it's fairly transient, and uh, these 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 platelets don't adhere, uh, don't fully develop a plug, but they do adhere to the uh, to the Kupfer cells, and this is uh, uh, yeah, and this is fully complement mediated. Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, so you had when you did the alpha toxin infusion, you had. Uh, 50% of the uh, aggregation happening on Kupfer cells and then 50% on endothelial cells, I think, more or less. So does the toxin activate endothelial cells and what are they, the platelets sticking to there? Uh, that's a good question and we haven't really figured that out. It could be to um, a Van Willemann factor, but we, um, we're currently looking into that process now, but we, we don't know this yet. Ross, you come from the Kubes lab. No mention of nets. No nets. No nets. Can you tell us about nets? Uh, I do know that nets are formed after staph infection, and we have published on that before. And also net contributes to uh, this process. But for this study, we, uh, we, uh, we didn't look at nets. And um, uh, because it's such a di uh, direct effect on the platelets that we can see with the toxin that we uh, um, for, for complexity, we left it out, the nets, right. So I noticed you obviously you had P-select and positive platelets in some of these experiments. So have you looked at fibrin staining um, in your, in your um, injury models? Well, not the injury models, the, the imaging studies? Not yet, no. Yeah. no. But uh, yeah, we can definitely do that. And there's also an active probe that we can actually use that, uh, that uh, measures fibrinolysis uh, in vivo. So yeah, that's definitely on the plan to do uh, on the list. Thank you. Got it. Okay. So to continue on our sort of sepsis type of uh, talks, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Patricia Rao from, um, the, uh, from McMaster University. She's a professor of medicine there um, and a scientist um, at TARI, the Thrombosis and Atherosclerosis Research Institute. I've been paid to show this slide. Patricia, she's dying, okay? <clears throat> this increases the sponsorship of my um, of this program because her colleagues at Tari insisted. Notice the uh, the new supportive stocking style there. 
All right. So, <laughs> sorry, Patricia. So Patricia comes uh, is is um, has a great history in terms of uh, her professional um, uh, contributions to this field in uh, in uh, linking coagulation with inflammation and innate immunity and uh, sorting out uh, underlying mechanisms. Um, she's terrific because she's really. Um, a translational research, a PhD research scientist who interfaces with uh, the clinicians to sort out um, these uh, these problems, which are, as we've heard, are major. So, Patricia, sorry about that. <laughs> it's all yours. So, I just use the arrows, Ed, to yeah. advance the slide. Okay. This one here? Oh, yeah, the arrow's here, and that's there. Okay. You're good. Thanks. So th thanks to Ed Conway for the kind invitation to speak here. Um, that uh, photo he put up, so every year I organize a Halloween dress-up contest for the graduate students, and I provide the prizes, and uh, I'm a participant as well, although I've never won. Um, <laughs> So this is my third time at UBC. Uh, the first time I came, I was actually a graduate student uh, with Jeff White at McMaster, and Jeff sent me for a week to Ross McGilvery's lab to learn how to do cloning and uh, protein expression. And Jeff gave me two pieces of advice. Number one, he said, make sure you take a lot of good notes at Ross's lab. And number two, make sure you bring him a bottle of scotch. Uh, <laughs> So the title of my presentation is New Anticoagulant Targets to Treat Sepsis. And in the past few years, we've also been doing a lot of uh, clinical and translational studies. So I added um, a second part to the title, which is how to improve our approach to sepsis research. So according to the World Health Organization, sepsis is a global medical emergency. It's a life-threatening condition characterized by systemic activation of inflammation and coagulation in response to microbial infection. There are between six to eight million lives lost annually, and um, although there are management strategies that include early administration of antibiotics, fluid resuscitation, and mechanical ventilation, the mortality rate for sepsis remains high, 25% uh, to 40%. So it suggests that we're either not uh, targeting the right pathways or maybe we're not selecting the right subset of septic patients to treat or perhaps both. So there's a nice review um, that was written by John Marshall. And uh, in the review, he indicated that there had been more than 60 clinical trials performed in sepsis involving more than 22,000 patients. And although these um, agents showed early promise in preclinical studies and in animal models, none of the trials have resulted in new treatments. So it suggests that perhaps one size does not fit all. Um, this was a paper from uh, 2002 where they did a meta-analysis of preclinical studies and they showed that antisepsis agents are actually more effective in patients with a higher risk of death and were actually more harmful in those with a lower risk. So this uh, led to um, several review articles where the focus was on rethinking strategies for sepsis. And these included strategies for clinical trial enrichment, for example, prognostic enrichment, where you're trying to enroll those patients at the highest risk of dying. There's also predictive enrichment where um, the aim is to enroll patients that are most likely to respond to a specific type of antisepsis therapy. So what are potential mediators of death in septic patients? We know that coagulation and inflammation are intimately linked in the host response to infection, and there have been numerous uh, antisepsis studies looking at anti-inflammatory mediators and also um, agents that inhibit the coagulation cascade. And in more recent years, the focus has been on the role of neutrophils, and particularly uh, neutrophil extracellular traps, or nets, which consist of extracellular DNA, which we call cell-free DNA, as well as histones, and um, the neutrophil enzymes and antimicrobial proteins associated with them. So from the perspective of innate immunity, the release of chromatin 
um, as well as antimicrobial peptides from neutrophils that are activated either by microbes or LPS or in the context of sterile inflammation, autoantibodies. With respect to inf infection, the web-like structures, at least in vitro, can bind to pathogens, uh, trap them, and facilitate the killing of the microbes. However, um, the DNA and histone components of these structures can e exert collateral damage to the host. So for example, uh, we and others have shown that DNA, due to its negative charge, can activate the intrinsic pathway of blood coagulation uh, through uh, auto activation of factor 12. So if you have high levels of circulating DNA in the blood, that can serve as the natural foreign surface that can activate blood coagulation. So although the, uh, oh, another um, feature of DNA is that it can impair fibrinolysis. So if there are high levels of DNA in uh, septic patients' plasma samples, the clots that are formed from these samples are resistant to fibrinolysis. So although they, the DNA and histones exert protective effects by uh, ensnaring and killing microorganisms, they can trigger blood coagulation, um, impair fibrinolysis, and the histones through binding to toll-like receptors 2 and 4 can activate platelets, and they're also cytotoxic to vascular endothelial cells. So in a mouse model of sequel ligation and puncture, which is the gold standard for uh, sepsis, we found that uh, within four to six hours after the um, induction of sepsis, we see an increase in circulating levels of DNA in the blood. And this uh, correlates with increases in IL-6, decreases in IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, and also increases in thrombin antithrombin complexes, which is a marker of uh, coagulation activation. So we hypothesize that if um, high levels of DNA are released and that promotes coagulation and inhibits fibrinolysis, that may contribute to uh, microvascular thrombosis and that it may be possible to um, improve outcome in sepsis by administering recombinant DNAs. So this is palmazine, which is currently used for the treatments of patients with cystic fibrosis to remove the uh, excessive amounts of DNA that it's in their lungs. So in our case, we actually injected the recombinant DNA's IP, and we found that um, it does reduce organ damage and improve outcome. Another group, um, this is a study by Wellhagen, they've targeted the histones in sepsis. And they found that in vitro, histones can neutralize, sorry, they found in vitro that heparin can neutralize the cytotoxic and platelet activating effects of histones. And that um, if you use a non-anticoagulant heparin, there was um, improvement in survival without uh, increased risk of bleeding. And they made their non-anticoagulant heparin um, by taking clinical grade heparin and purifying it through an antithrombin column. So a few years ago, we made the observations that septic patients have very high levels of circulating DNA in their blood. And in a pilot study of 80 patients uh, recruited from three uh, ICUs in Hamilton, we found that uh, DNA was able to uh, predict 28-day mortality. So in receiver operating characteristic analysis, the area under the curve for DNA was uh, 0.96 which was actually much higher than clinical scores such as Apache 2 in the multiple organ dysfunction or MOD score. We also found in that pilot study, and, and this is um, in agreement with several previous publications, that septic patients have lo low levels of protein C in their blood and the platelet counts are also reduced. So protein C, as you know, is a natural anticoagulant and it prevents clotting in the, mic in the microcirculation. Acquired protein C deficiency may result in microvascular thrombosis and tissue necrosis, and in sepsis, protein C and platelets are consumed due to consumptive coagulopathy, and decreases in protein C 
in platelet counts uh, correlate with poor outcome in sepsis. Um, others have also shown that septic patients have high levels of lactate in their blood and elevations in blood lactate levels reflect tissue hypoperfusion. And actually, um, current guidelines recommend that if your blood lactate is twice the normal level, um, they recommend that patients be resuscitated. So what about currently available clinical scores? So the multiple organ dysfunction score was originally created to describe um, organ dysfunction. And the MOD score has six components, um, which include the platelet count, so that's an indicator of hematologic dysfunction, creatinine for uh, renal function, the Glasgow Coma Score, bilirubin, uh, pressure-adjusted heart rate, and then PaO2 over FiO2 ratio for uh, respiratory function. However, in um, terms of its prognostic ability, it's actually quite modest. But we hypothesize that maybe it's possible to com combine some of the biological markers along with clinical scores to improve prognosis. So we found in multivariate analysis that of these six components, only three of them um, have prognostic value. So these include the platelet count, the creatinine level, and the Glasgow Coma Score. Uh, a few years ago, we were funded by the CIHR to perform a large um, multicenter observational study of uh, ICU patients with sepsis, and our objective was to develop a personalized tool for assessing mortality risk in these patients. And we hypothesized that the combinations of high levels of DNA, low levels of protein C, um, and elevated levels of lactate along with three of the components of the MOS score can help to identify septic patients uh, at the greatest risk of death. So we collected blood samples every day for the first week, and then we also collected the samples daily thereafter for as long as they were in the ICU. There was a lot of clinical information that we collected, including pre-existing comorbidities, uh, their daily organ functions, routine lab parameters, the site and type of infection, and whether or not there were any pharmacological co-interventions, such as the use of vasopressors, uh, steroids, or fluid resuscitation. Um, so we didn't have a formal statistician, uh, and my dad happened to be a retired statistician, so he took on this project uh, for free, which is fantastic. And the downside of that is I could never get a quick two-minute answer from him when I approached him. It turned into, oh, you need to meet with me for at least three hours to fully understand this. So he developed a uh, complementary log-log model, which is basically a uh, flexible version of the Cox model for survival analysis. And the unique thing about this approach is that we weren't just looking at markers on day one. We actually were looking at how these biological and clinical uh, indicators are changing throughout the course of the patient's stay, which is different from most uh, published studies where they looked at you know, levels at day one and they tried to predict 28-day mortality. So this is, uh, for anyone who's interested, this was the multivariate model that was used in the analysis. Uh, this just shows the baseline characteristics of the septic patients that we recruited. The 28-day mortality rate was around 24%, percent, which is consistent with other studies. And this uh, just highlights all the clinical data that we gathered uh, to describe the baseline characteristics. So it, it included uh, which organs were infected, which type of microorganisms were present, and any pre-existing conditions that the patients had. So in the initial multivariate analysis, we found that there are a certain number of variables that were not useful in predicting outcome. So that included the gender of the patient, whether or not they're using uh, vasopressors or inotropes. The site of infection also did not impact uh, mortality and also the type of microorganism didn't appear to impact outcome either. So it didn't matter if you had gram-negative or gram-positive infection or mix, um, that wasn't important for prognosis. What was important was the uh, existing pre two pre-existing conditions. So these included previous brain injury and also uh, chronic lung disease. 
So these are just um, raw graphs to show the differences in DNA levels and protein C levels between survivors and non-survivors. So in the non-survivor patients, the levels of DNA were higher, consistent with a, a hypercoagulable state, and levels of protein C in the non-survivors uh, were lower and did not uh, return to normal levels that you would normally see in the survivor patients. Lactate levels were higher in uh, non-survivor patients, and also uh, non-survivor patients had lower levels of platelets, higher levels, levels of creatinine, and lower uh, Glasgow coma scores. So using these six indicators and knowing how they change over time, we we're able to develop an algorithm that can not only uh, predict the probability of dying within 28 days, but also the probability of dying on a specific day. And I think that may have application for use in uh, guiding clinical trials of new investigational therapies. So in this particular patient, uh, he had high levels of DNA, very low levels of protein C, and the predicted probability of dying on day 28 was 97%. The predicted probability of dying on a certain day, in this day, in this case we picked uh, just day 11, was 12%. So that makes sense because you have a higher chance of dying in a large uh, window of time versus if you were looking at the probability of dying on one specific day. This is an example of a patient who had normal levels of DNA, um, moderate levels of protein C, and the predicted probability of dying in 28 days was only 20%, and the probability of dying on day 11 was 0.8%. So to extend our studies, we wanted to know not only their probability of dying on a certain day, but also are there any biological markers that I can identify uh, the likely responders. And what we mean by this is, we we're able to create uh, individual or personalized um, mortality risk profiles that highlights which of these six indicators is contributing, to the, contributing the most to the risk of dying. So for this patient, and the y-axis is a hazard ratio minus one, um, it looks like protein C and platelets are contributing the most to the risk of dying. So this specific profile suggests that abnormalities in protein C and platelets are the major contributors to this patient's risk of dying. And we had a um, really energetic uh, medical resident who used to work for Google, and he was able to develop an online personalized tool, which um, at this point is just proof of principle. But what it would look like is you would be able to enter the day one values for each of these six indicators. So whether it's protein C or platelets or DNA or the mod components. And then you can also in input the values of these indicators on day X. Let's say day X is a week later. It would then create a graph on the bottom that shows you the relative contribution of each of the indicators for the uh, patient's risk of dying. So to summarize, we've identified six biological indicators that may be useful for assessing mortality risk in sepsis. And this includes um, circulating levels of DNA, which is a procoagulant, an antifibrinolytic agent, protein C, lactate, platelets, GCS, and creatinine. We also developed a personalized tool that could generate a unique risk profile for each patient, and the tool is based on a, a time-variant complementary log-log model where we're looking at how these indicators change over time, whether they're improving or getting worse. And so the tool has the potential uh, utility not only for prognostic enrichment, but also for predictive enrichment, which may be leveraged to improve the success of future clinical trials. Uh, just very briefly, so some other ongoing studies. So DNA is not something that is routinely measured. Uh, the way we've measured it in this current study is that the blood samples are taken back to our lab and processed, and we quantitated the, the amount of DNA through the spectrophotometer. This paper that we published was in collaboration with Ravi, which is in the engineering department at McMaster. So we've developed a micro 
fluidic device that can uh, quantitate levels of DNA in the patient's plasma samples within uh, a few minutes. So right now, it's, it's not miniaturized yet, but it's basically um, a way to concentrate fluorescently labeled DNA. So in this case, we labeled it with pico green. And we move the DNA across a direct current electric field. And so when the DNA reaches this bridge of agros, it, the movement is uh, slowed. And then you can connect the fluorescent microscope to a laptop and then uh, quantitate the DNA that way. And just want to uh, thank many investigators within the Canadian Critical Care Translational Biology Group at TARI and also the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group as well as uh, funding from CIHR and uh, many great collaborators uh, at TARI and also um, my dad at McMaster University. Thank you. Very nice talk, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, so the cause that the DMA, DNA makes is, uh, like because there is cell damage, the DNA is released, right? So that's actually like what happens after the cell is already damaged. How could the DNAs help to prove, you know, the condition? Like is the DNA itself also causing damage or, you know? Yeah, so we think that the DNA is uh, not just a bystander of the um, immune response to sepsis. We think that it actually contributes to uh, sepsis pathophysiology. So we found that um, in those patients with very high levels of DNA in their blood, their blood is extremely procoagulant. Uh, we've done some in vitro tests and also uh, hypofibrinolytic, meaning that it's resistant to clot lysis. So we hypothesize that maybe getting rid of that DNA by digesting it with recombinant DNAs would improve, out would improve um, organ function and outcome. Do you think that's because of the charge of the DNA or what do you think the mechanism uh, So in terms of promoting coagulation, it is most likely the charge. So it can activate uh, through the intrinsic pathway. And in terms of fibrinolysis, we've shown that the DNA can bind to fibrinogen as well as to fibrin, and it prevents plasma-mediated digestion of the fibrin clot. I was just, sorry, just one more question. I was just wondering, has anybody ever looked at RNA, for example? Uh, we haven't looked at RNA, but um, in vitro at least, being a nucleic acid, RNA is also procoagulant. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's really just sort of a way of saying this person's already in trouble or is proportional to how in trouble they are? Yeah, the question is, is the amount of DNA in indicator of how sick the patient is? Is that your question? Of the, of the load, of the infectious load, as well as the patient, the damage to the patient already. Um, so right now we're assuming that the DNA that we measure in the blood is actually coming from neutrophils and we don't have any direct proof that it is. So we proposed, we've proposed to do some um, methylation studies to identify the tissue source, but right now if we assume that most of it is coming from neutrophils, the amount of uh, coagulation that is triggered is proportional to the amount of DNA but we haven't actually linked the DNA to neutrophils in, in the patients. So for example, we also collected um, samples from non-septic patients as controls. And in patients without infections, for example, trauma patients, there are also elevations in DNA, and that presumably is coming from um, you know, massive tissue injury as opposed to sepsis where it's coming mainly from neutrophils that helps to explain things. So we don't really know the source at this point. We're hypothesizing that it is coming from neutrophils, at least in the context of sepsis. Uh, hi, nice talk. 
So I was wondering, did you see any correlation between thrombosis and circulatory dysfunction in these patients? A correlation between thrombosis and what and, was? Uh, uh, circulatory dysfunction. And circulatory dysfunction, uh, as measured by coagulation activation, you mean? Uh, as or? measured by formation of sludges, I mean RBC sludges, sludging formation that leads to... Uh, so, sorry, I'm not sure what, what you mean by... So in sepsis, what happens is, uh, like in uh, kidney, so the RBC, they coagulate with each other, and they form sludges. So that hampers the microcirculation, and that leads to uh, loss of oxygen to the kidney and the kidney, then there's kidney failure. So is there any correlation between this process and thrombosis ever in sepsis? Uh, so in our most model of sequel ligation and puncture, we found that when we administer the recombinant DNAs, the circula circulating level, level of DNAs is reduced and the organ function is improved. So we do see fibrin deposition, for example, in the lungs, and upon treatment with DNAs, you do see uh, reduction in that. So that would suggest that there is improvement in the microcirculation. Lovely. I'm wondering if patients are inherently low in protein C, or are we looking at a thrombomodulin type of problem? Uh, for both patients, whether they survive or they do not survive, they all come into the ICU with protein C levels of around 50%. And uh, in the patients that survive, we do see a normalization of protein C to near normal levels by day four or five. We haven't looked at circulating levels of thrombomodulin to see if that might further uh, exacerbate the deficiency because obviously without TM on the endothelium, even if you had protein C, you couldn't get it converted to activated protein C. Um, so at this point, we've only measured uh, protein C, but we can measure soluble TM as well. I guess just to follow up on that, did you look at factor five and eight levels? Since if, if presumably protein C is getting activated, I, I would presume. It, um, so are, are those levels lower? Um, so in order to measure activated protein C, you have to collect the blood into benzambidine. So we've got an in-house method to measure activated protein C. There seems to be a disconnect between how much thrombin is present and how much activated protein C is generated. So for some patients, it looks like um, the more thrombin you have, the more activated protein C you generate, which makes sense because thrombin cleaves uh, protein C right. to APC. But in terms of uh, 5A, so you're thinking 5A levels to look at? Yeah, or both, 5, 5, 5A, five 8A, eight, eight either one. I mean, it's a substrate for APC, so you would imagine the levels would be lower. Yeah, uh, we haven't looked at that yet. Yes? Um, so we didn't really have, the question is why do we include brain injury as part of our prognostic algorithm? So we didn't have any pre-existing thoughts on that. We simply documented some of the uh, chronic conditions that the patients already had when they were admitted to the ICU. And because we had almost 400 patients, we were able to do multivariate analysis to see if any of those pre-existing conditions might be um, useful for prognosis, and it turned out that pre-existing brain injury was important and chronic lung disease. And I'm not an expert in brain injury, but my understanding is that when the brain is injured, that also impacts the, um, the host immune response. Hi. Uh, so I was really interested in the fact that six parameters was what you were able to use for your diagnostic mortality risk. Um, so the patients that you were looking at were typically septic, so severe sepsis or um, septic shock. Does this, uh, these six parameters come up when you're looking at early sepsis? Um, you mean looking at s just SIRS or? SIRS, yeah. So They've, they've removed the term severe sepsis. Right now, the current definition is sepsis, and, and that includes at least one dysfunctional 
organ. Um, we've started a study to look at patients that are coming into the eMERGE with suspected sepsis, and I think that would be important just to sort of get the, um, you know, the, the time frame of how these things change before they actually hit the ICU. The current patients are already um, in the ICU, but yeah, that's, that's a great idea. If we look at them like in eMERGE, we may be able to see how these um, meteors are actually changing over time. Okay, so before we break for lunch, I need all those poster presenters to line up for your 30-second shotgun talks. And you can come on this side. Where are you, poster presenters? Let's go, let's go, let's go. We want to eat. You know the routine. It's, I'd suggest to start over here because there's stairs over here. You can trip over on the way back. Oh, wow. Okay. 30 seconds max. 30 seconds. No more. All right? One after the other. You can start. Hi, my name is Beverly Bikir, and I'm a PhD student in uh, the Bob Hancock lab. And I study cellular reprogramming, which has been connected to the immune amnesia observed in sepsis patients, um, specifically looking at monocytes. Uh, therefore, my hypothesis is that monocytes are able to drive this cellular, this, uh, cellular reprogramming phenotype during sepsis. And we found that when we replicate cellular reprogramming in vitro, we have increased expression of our predictive cellular reprogramming um, signature. So this is important since this signature could be applied to preceptic patients and determine whether or not they can go on to develop sepsis. If you want to know more, my poster is number 15. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Nitesh Arora. I'm a PG student in uh, Will Jeffy's lab. Uh, I'm presenting a poster today entitled Role of ATP Binding Cassette Molecules in Mammalian Embryogenesis and Development. Uh, what we have discovered is that ABCF1 is critically important for mammalian embryogenesis as the complete knockout mouse model was embryonic lethal at day 3.5. Uh, hence, it means that no life mice was ever born. So we created uh, ABCF1 heterozygous mouse model with beta gal cassette for DNA tracing. And we found that ABCF1 is not only important for blastocyte formation, it's also important for embryo heart and brain formation. Uh, in adult mice, we saw that ABCF1 is present in almost all organs. And the promoter activity was maximum in kidney, heart, lung, and small intestine. My poster number is 10. I'll be more than happy to talk to you more about it. Thank you. Yes, hi everyone, my name is Frank Lee. I'm an MD-PhD student in Ed Prysdell's lab. Um, we've discovered that plasmin cleaves and converts the coagulation factor five um, from, a 10A, for, from a factor 10A procoagulant cofactor to a fibrinolysis cofactor to accelerate tissue plasminogen activator activity. If you'd like to hear more, I'll be at poster seven. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Arjun. I'm a bioinformatics master's student in the Hancock lab. So my project involves exploring the transcriptomes of sepsis patients. Uh, so specifically, I've tried to integrate transcriptomic data with clinical data to better predict whether someone goes on to, to sepsis. Uh, two, I'm trying to identify upstream regulators uh, using this transcriptome data. Uh, <laughs> upstream regulators of a, a sepsis gene signature, sorry, that we previously identified. And also, I'm working on an omics data integration pipeline to better uh, integrate transcriptomic data, metabolomics data, and proteomics data. And we're specifically using this, using this to refine our sepsis gene signature. Thanks. Hi, my name is Pierre. I'm postdoc in the Brom lab. So I'm interested in the involvement of um, elastolytic existing sepsis in vascular calcification, which is one of the complications that occurs during atrial sclerosis. Uh, so, so far we found that actually the calcification of elastin is a protective mechanism against further elastin degradation. And on the other hand, uh, degradation of elastin itself just increases its sensitivity to calcification processes. 
So moreover, we also found that the degradation of elastin just generates uh, elastin fragments referred to as elastokines, which are bioactive. And when we tested against the vascular smooth muscle cell line, we figured out actually this elastin fragment just increased um, the calcification of these um, cell lines through uh, transition from vascular smooth muscle cell phenotype to osteoblastic phenotype. Uh, so if you want to discuss more about this, feel free to drop by poster number 23. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Simon and I'm a graduate student in Data Brahms Lab as well. Um, today I'm presenting a poster on the compound NSC13345. Um, this compound is an inhibitor of Cacepsin K, which has been implicated in um, osteoporosis. And our structural studies have um, found that this inhibitor binds in three different locations on the enzyme, and each of these locations may modulate um, the substrate cleavage um, by Cacepsin K in different ways. And if you want to hear more about this uh, inhibitor and our enzyme, um, come to please come see poster number 18. Thank you. Blood clots are good if they prevent bleeding. Uh, but they are bad if they cause thrombosis. So current therapeutics target both the good and the blood, bad blood clots. As a result, they have a huge bleeding side effects. Hello, everyone. I'm Sri Parna uh, from Kizagera 2 Lab, and we are targeting the bad blood clots to prevent the risk of bleeding. So if you want to know more about this strategy, come check out my poster. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Chanel. I'm uh, also from Jay Kazakadathu's lab. And um, our goal so far has been to design and synthesize a uh, library of poly cationic polymeric structures in hopes of inhibiting polyphosphates to safely reduce thrombosis. Um, we've looked at certain parameters such as increasing charge density on the polymer, size of the polymer, and um, charge separation on the polymer. So if you guys want to find out a little bit about how they've been behaving in vitro, um, come see my poster at number 21. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Anoli De Silva, and I'm a graduate student from the Kim Lab. And we're interested in studying the molecular mechanism of platelet apoptosis, which is one mechanism that platelets use to regulate their lifespan. Um, one of the problems of assessing apoptosis in platelets is that um, some of its features also occur during platelet activation. So we've optimized the conditions to specifically induce apoptosis without inducing activation in platelets. Um, in order to uncover the mechanism of apoptosis, we focused on the role of filament A, which is an actin binding protein. And it's been previously shown to protect nucleated cells against force-induced apoptosis. So we hypothesized that um, filament A protects uh, and promotes platelet survival by um, uh, regulating the tripartite protein association between von Willebrand factor, GP1B, and 1433. So if you're interested in learning more about this topic, please come visit me at poster number five. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Cecilia. I'm working in Dr. Hugh Kim's lab. Uh, it has been found that titanium surface dental uh, titanium dental implant surface modification is able to improve dental implant also integration, which means the direct bonding between the uh, implant and its host bone tissue. Um, so my research investigates the interaction between modified titanium surfaces and platelet, which is one of the first cell type to attach onto implant surface after uh, surgical implantation. Um, and we found the, surf the titanium surface microtexture could modulate platelet adhesion and activation via circ kinase phosphorylation. If you are interested in this topic, please come to my poster number four. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ning from CBR Scott Lab. Uh, my poster is about the lymphocyte deformability. The activity of lymphocyte largely depends on uh, migration, the ability to deform and flow through narrow channels. Uh, in collaboration with Dr. Hongshen Ma's lab, we started lymphocyte deformability using their microfluidic ratchet device. 
Uh, our results suggest that uh, the intracellular granularity can significantly impact on lymphocyte deformability. If you are interested in this topic, please come to visit me at poster number 16. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Chuan Guo, and I'm, I'm a postdoc from Multiscale Design Lab, and my PI is Professor Hong Shen Ma. My research area is cell sorting, uh, specifically my poster is titled Deformability-Based Cell Sorting Using Microfluidic Ratchets that enables a phenotypic separation of leukocytes directly from whole blood. So basically, my, uh, we develop a microfluidic device that improves upon microfiltration to not only completely deplete ribosomes cells to separate leukocytes, but also to uh, separate major subsets of leukocytes directly from whole blood. So if you're interested in cell sorting, uh, leukocyte deformability, or microfluidic lab on the chip in general. Welcome to my poster number 12. Thanks. Hello, my name is Jeff, and I am a master's student in the Hugh Kim lab. I'm interested in platelet secretion characterization. So I hope to do this using multiplex arrays to analyze the various secretion profiles of different agonists. If you want to know more, I'll be on post number three. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Nathaniel. I'm from the Sternatica lab. Um, I'm looking at protein-protein interactions uh, during peptidoglycan biosynthesis. If you'd like to know more, I'm at poster two. Thanks. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I'm James Bills. I work for Christian Kastrup. Chinese amic acid is a super great antifibrinolytic agent that has been used to treat all sorts of bleeding for basically forever. Uh, recent clinical trials have shown that IV Chinese amic acid is really great at improving mortality following trauma if given really quickly, but if given too late, it actually decreases, er, increases mortality. <laughs> uh, to increase the applicability and hemostatic efficacy of tranexamic acid, we have formulated it with self-propelling particles. Uh, these particles can be applied topically, and we've shown in a mouse model it is superior to IV formulations of tranexamic acid to stop bleeding, and in a big, scary model of pig traumatic bleeding, it was able to stop bleeding really good. Uh, come to poster number one. Hi, my name is Linda. I'm a PhD student in Scott Lab. Uh, T cell mediated pro inflammatory immune response is critical for cancer cell elimination. And our lab has manufactured a novel uh, cell free allo recognition based therapeutic IA1 from the bioreactor systems. And IA1 enhances the pro inflammatory immune response in naive T cells. These activated naive T cells attenuate cancer cell proliferation. Uh, moreover, um, the extracellular microRNA uh, enriched fraction of IA1 mediated the majority of the anti-cancer effects of naive T cells. To find more details about IA1, please vis uh, visit the uh, mistakenly oversized poster number 14. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm an undergraduate student in the Conway lab. And one of our projects is looking at CD248 and its role in thrombosis. After using an IVC model in mice, we found that CD248 knockout mice actually had smaller clots. So our project has been focusing on understanding the mechanisms in which CD248 can affect clot. So we are looking at cellular and plasma-mediated mechanisms. And so far, we think that actually a deficiency in CD248 attenuates tissue factor activity which might affect why coagulation is different in knockout and wild type. If you want to know more, you can come visit poster 11, I think. <laughs> okay, so that's still the thunder of my talk. All right, so <laughs> um, thanks to all the, the students who gave these short little talks. And thank you for a great morning to all the speakers and all of you. And we'll um, adjourn now for lunch and poster of viewing. And then we will regroup at 1.30 sharp. Is everybody still cold? Yes. yes. OK, I can see Gao is just freezing cold. All right. OK, I'm going to do something better. I'll light a fire up here on the stage. OK? All right.